Right then. Well, th this feels like uh, me getting back on the horse, very much back on the horse, having had a fairly extended podcasting break, minus a couple of small interventions. Um, but I'm I'm really excited to have this conversation. Um, you know, we're into the new year, well into the new year. Won't be saying Happy New Year to people anymore because we're well into the new year. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to get back and having some conversations. And uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Jordan Cassidy. Jordan, welcome to the Talent Equation. Thank you for having me. Oh, that's great. Uh, and I'm going to, right from the get-go, uh, make another apology. We made an, I made an apology before we started recording, make another apology because Jordan's been very patient. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have been offended or in any way disappointed had he just told me to literally do one because I've had to cancel this recording about four times because of various things that have cropped up in life, not least of which getting poorly. But anyway, I'm there now. I'm there. I'm better um slight slightly less nasal than I was last week but anyway you know you just have to put up with it uh, anyway Jordan let's start with you um just give me the story then tell me about like what w why you're you know kind of where why you've ended up where you've ended up what's the sort of the whole history of all of this yeah so I suppose I like I started out obviously undergrad I started out kind of in the strength and conditioning sports science space and I was in that for quite a while and then um it was a very specific moment kind of when I when I got into more the skill acquisition predominantly ecological dynamics initially was uh, when I was looking at agility and um you know I, I distinctly remember taking taking players through a through a particular change of direction drill we had 15 minutes 10 minute warm-up five minutes of activity and then they went in and they played their games and we we were drilling this particular drilling a particular move for five minutes and then they went into their games and then i just as i was picking up my cones i looked at one particular player and the opportunity to actually make the step that we'd been working on and he didn't do it he just ran straight into contact and then I kind of that was a reflective period like wh why why um why is what the training that I'm doing why does it not lead to performance in the game and uh, so I, I sort of started going down the ecological dynamics rabbit hole then and then that kind of evolved a bit more. So now, now I'm currently doing my master's in skill acquisition and um, supporting coaches um, across a range of different contexts. It's just almost out of my own curiosity, just trying to figure out some answers along the way, but inevitably coming up with more questions. Inev inevitably. I can actually hear, I can actually hear Marco Sullivan typing a WhatsApp message to me as as we're speaking because he you know in the in your opening there you've just sort of a beautiful setup you know we've not only had the d word drill we've also had cones <laughs> he will be he will be honestly he'll be on to me straight away and i know you said that you actually managed to have a couple of conversations with mark fairly recently so uh yeah i imagine he'll have uh, you'll know that oh, oh too well he'll he'll take great great joy and mirth in that yeah, you might send me the same message. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, you, you mentioned about doing the sort of S and C stuff. So that was what you did at undergrad, and then, um, and you say you went down the ecological dynamics rabbit hole. It is funny how people talk about it as a rabbit hole. Uh, I mean, I guess a, a bit like me, I suppose. Would you say then? Because I, I mean, one of the reasons we're having a conversation is because you did a really, really good and interesting blog post that I want to talk about a little bit more. But I, I sense that, um, you know, what you're currently doing is exploring the, I don't know, the, the sort of the limitations of the theory, really, and 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 sort of exploring kind of what its utility is. And I can, I think I sensed in in your article. Um, uh, which I'll link to in the show notes for everybody, but by the way, but I sensed in your show notes that kind of those kind of questions, you know, like how far can we go with this? How much of this can we apply genuinely in the real world? You know, when is it appropriate to sort of like borrow from different theoretical approaches and apply them? 
So is that still the journey you're on? Have you found more an more answers to the questions or is it just questions on questions? I, I, you know, a, a lot of questions. I've just asked a lot of questions. Sorry. So just just yeah. feel feel no, free to riff great. off that. <laughs> yeah, like I suppose. Well, firstly, I mean, there's never answers. There's just new questions. So mm. that's kind of where I'm at. I suppose what I've been thinking about lately is um within a performance environment so you have your coach and whether it's a high performance or whether it's even a development squad or whatever else you've got so many different people with different roles and like for me um you know just looking at one aspect in isolation you know th that that's very limiting so like i kind of started thinking about well if we're going to work together, like we have to, like we have to appreciate what each person, what each kind of role within it, within a department is trying to do. So, like, I mean, touching on strength and conditioning, like, um, strength and conditioning doesn't merge, and we're kind and kind of working on this as well, like uh, at the paper coming out or in review about this as well, like is strength and conditioning and skill acquisition, is it kind of symbiotic or like can they work together? But I think a crucial thing to remember is strength and conditioning coaches often have a very different role to skill acquisition specialists. Now, mm. that's not to say they can't work together, but each each side has to be respectful of what the other side is trying to do mm -hmm. and there are like i suppose there are times where you know you prioritize one side and times when you prioritize the other or times when you try and merge them as best you can so i suppose that was that was and that was um the start of kind of my exploration and then just over time i, I sort of started working more in the prime primarily in the skill acquisition space where you know supporting coaches more so more so in the supporting coaches rather than actually the athlete development it was more on the coach development side um and like here here in brisbane i've been pretty fortunate to work with coaches all along the spectrum so development schools clubs um all the way up to uh high performance and like so it's it's been quite enjoyable that in that sense but um yeah it's like where am I at now like I suppose I mean there's a few different few different ways to go about it like but like in terms of my my current work is it's all around working in course development and um working as a skill acquisition specialist how can we support coaches and I suppose what stimulated a lot of my um my, my two recent so the article that you mentioned um my two recent post is understanding the role the role that a coach has so like as a skill acquisition specialist like sure i can make recommendations for or you could you could add in a defender here make make more representative here or you know, just allow the athlete to explore and all that. Like I could do all that, but at the same time, before I just throw out kind of recommendations, it's really important to actually understand what the coach's context is. Mm. So understanding what are the limitations, what are they trying to do, what is not just the coach's context, but wider than that, what is the organization's context? Mm in terms of like and uh, i mean we can talk about this in terms of a course development strategy from the organization is that because of because their government funding was you know cut mm. so like there's all these questions which ultimately impact the coach's decision and as well the athlete's experience of the coach's kind of session that they've set up so like yeah i suppose as you, as you can probably tell, like I'm, I'm a bit all over the place, but like that's kind of just the nature of it. You know, you're trying to trying to figure stuff out. And as, as we said before, the more you figure out, the more questions you, you figure out as well at the same time. So the more you know, the more you don't know kind of thing. So, yeah, I don't know where you want to take that. But... Well, actually, no, you say something really interesting. Um, So I, I do want to obviously I do want to talk about the article, but um. 
something you just said there that was interesting right at the start of that which is this sort of notion of um so so you, as i understand it you're writing a paper talking about how currently there's a little bit of a paradigm where the role of a strength and conditioning practitioner and the role of a skill and ac skill acquisition specialist are sort of separate um and you're going to argue in your paper from the sounds of things that actually s and c and s and c practice and skill acquisition practice really are one and the same and should be more more, more synonymous and i think there is a growing movement amongst amongst skill acquisition uh, sorry um s and c practitioners that that is the case you know you when you s listen to the stuff that say someone like franz bosch talks about you definitely hear that kind of messaging coming out obviously the guys at emergence uh you know sean tyler and the gang over there they're talking about that a lot and there's a growing movement of snc practitioners that are definitely think integrating ideas around skill acquisition uh into their thinking and into their practice so i think what you're but if i if i've understood you correctly that there you know there should be a, a greater synergy between the two um then I, I am almost interested to know like I didn't, I'd actually thought we'd got past that a little bit and actually S&C and skill acquisition were actually synonymous, but you're arguing to me that maybe they're not in some cases. Yeah, like, so I go back to the point um, around, like, they had different kind of focus points. So okay. yeah. um, to do, to do, um, to do a disservice to S&C, mm -hmm. um, they're generally <laughs> looking to make, make athletes bigger stronger faster mm. now that's a that's an oversimplification but like that's not necessarily the, the case with um skill acquisition specialists they're trying to skill acquisition are often trying to make athletes more comfortable in their environment so they can express their skills or express their physical capacities or whatever it is so like they do have different and like because they have different focus points um there there there's naturally going to be different methods of you know of training to mm. to to achieve their aim um like and i suppose so there are some particular things that yeah, yeah i mean you can merge but should everything be merged like if so you if you, if you had it on a spectrum mm. so s and c skill acquisition on each on one end and mm. you only train stuff in the middle where it's all merged mm. you're probably going to be undercooked in terms of physical capacities but you're probably going to be undercooked in terms of you know so yeah what i suppose what i'd argue is that practitioners are um you know support teams they need to be able to move along the continuum at, um depending on the needs of of their team or or of their athletes or whatever it is so that's kind of the essence of the paper um at this point and um, we'll see how we'll see how it goes uh, no it's interesting and I, I guess that's one of the reasons i was sort of drawing because i've often i've often argued for just that or you know the, the what i you know the happy medium in the sense that i've all I've sort of said, and I'm not really coming at it from an S&C perspective, I may be coming at it more from the perspective of uh, strongly technically led activity, you know, movement pattern driven activity, which obviously S&C work does as well. Um, you know, and then the what you might call sort of the emergent movement paradigm, you know, context driving uh, movement solution. And I've uh, often said that actually the 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 problem with the sort of the largely technical model is, you know, you very often have young people in particular, you know, kind of waiting around for their go and doing stuff that's really quite dull and not particularly motivational. And the fear there really is, is that, you know, that actually people find, find the sports experience really quite um, meaningless and therefore as a result, maybe don't come back. And, you know, from a retention perspective, that's quite important. But also if you can then develop skill, that's where you want to have the sweet spot, but you're not saying that. So I'm saying that from the perspective of motivation and engagement and young people getting a joy of sport whilst also a developmental experience. I often refer to it as like the broccoli burger. You know, it's, it's nutritious and tasty at the same time. Um, albeit, you could argue, it's just not very tasty and not very nutritious. So kind of uh, from your perspective, you're talking about efficacy, I think, aren't you? Which is to say from an S&C perspe perspective, if you try and take 
either ends of the continuum only operate in the middle, then in reality, you're potentially actually, you, you, there, is a, there is scope that you're going to actually just do a pretty bang average job, I guess. Is that what you're sort of saying? Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. And like to kind of touch up, touch on what you you've just said around like you know if if you if you're training in the middle like at, at either end especially the kind of the technical end that can be kind of demotivating it can be mm. um if that's all you're doing yeah. i think i think there's there's a place for that kind of thing in appropriate doses mm. um e even if it's even if it's young kids and like there's a way to make that make all that pretty engaging like so just because it's a a drill, you know, a re, um, you know, just move run from one cone to the other, just because of stuff like that doesn't mean it can't be fun. Mm. So um, like I suppose it, it's pretty complex now. I suppose the other thing, and and th this is probably the key point. I mean, you've got to understand what your athletes are like so i'm talking athletes but like if if you're talking kids or players or whatever whatever learners whatever you want to call them you've got to understand really what what do your learners need mm. and then once you've understood what they need then you can appropriately kind of target that target that within the kind of in in within your own contextual and within their individual variability so i suppose i would like as much as possible <laughs> i'm almost trying to sit in the fence but like i'm trying to be trying to avoid just having a blanket statement of this is what we should be doing or this is what we should like you know what i mean yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's very very dependent on kind of the situation that you find yourself in well, this is this is good, right? So I, I did say you may have seen me that I I put something out on Twitter, which was to say, look, I, I really want to, I really want to have some conversations with people who don't necessarily, you know, where it's not just a kind of an agreement fest, and we're just violently nodding and agreeing with each other. You know, when there's points of difference, that's where actually there's some interesting stuff to discuss. So this is definitely one of those areas where I'm really interesting to pull on a few of these threads and see see where we can get to. Um, so uh, firstly, thank you for answering the call. I know you probably didn't didn't do that on purpose, but inadvertently you have. No one else has, by the way. Nobody else has actually said they want to come and have a conversation with me where we don't necessarily agree, which is interesting in itself. So I get accused of being an echo chamber. Well, there you go. That's partly why. But anyway, I'll still keep I'll still endeavor to have this kind of a conversation because it's where the interest lies for me. Because I have similar questions. Here's my thinking. Um so going back to this point around um the, I mean, you're essentially making the it depends argument, um, I guess, which is context matters. Um, and therefore, because of the context, the task and the individual themselves and the individuals that they're working with and the environment that they're in and all those factors. I think of it like a Newell's triangle. But for the coach, you know, they're, you're operating within an ecological niche and, you know, who you are, where you're working, who you're working with, what you're trying to do, trying to achieve all factor into, you know, kind of what those needs are. But there's a bit of a problem with that model, with that with that argument, which is th there's a real, real danger then, isn't there? That, that, well, one of two things happens. One is you're theoretically rudderless, right? So, and if you're theoretically rudderless, then potentially you're essentially going to say, well, anything goes. Because, you know, and, and I can understand why, by the way, prag pragmatically, that's probably the stance to take. Because... None of the theories are foolproof, are they? None of them are bulletproof. You know, they're all still emerging and evolving theories and ideas around things like human cognition and, you know, human development and adaptability and all these different things, right, are still ongoing learning things, you know, that have not been proven. So therefore, pragmatically, the logical thing to do, you would argue, is to, is to actually say, well, actually, I'm not going to you know, um, saddle all my horses to one wagon and sail off west and hope for the best. I'm going to be a bit more careful than that. And I'm going to sort of <clears throat> like, you know, as, as the knowledge emerges, I'm going to take more ideas and from different places and not exactly just sort of throw, throw the, the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. I guess my, my problem with that, the challenge I've, I've had with that is that um, I think there's an awful lot still to learn about. So, theoretically so as i look as i think of theory think of theories and the more i think about things like when people talk about ecological dynamics very often they start talking about method 
they talk about particular approaches like drills and technical and this, that, and the other. It, it's not. It's 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 a kind of worldview about the way humans uh, become able to do anything in the world. Uh, you know, one is, a, I think, I, I see the ecological one as more of a naturalized one, one where, you know, kind of humans are adapting to environmental stimulus and it's very individualized, et cetera, et cetera. And then the other one is, I would argue, a bit more of a kind of industrialized, mechanized one, which is one where we said, like, we've understood stuff about the human body. And now we know that actually we can shortcut some of this stuff by actually allowing people, well, in, uh, putting people into situations where if they repeat certain movement patterns uh, with enough regularity, then they'll become skillful practitioners. And the argument, I suppose, is one go, both of them are saying, well, neither of neither of neither of them are sufficient as theoretical explanations of human development um and actually you probably say ecological theorists would probably say actually no the technical model is completely flawed as an idea and actually most practitioners are actually have experienced the flaws in that and therefore have started to shift in a different direction right very long-winded i'm sorry i'll try and get to the end point here anyway so my point i suppose is um like i i'm I, th I feel like if you can't, I, I describe myself, I'm not a relativist, right? So I'm not saying like anything goes, right? But nor am I dogmatic enough to say, I mean, uh, I have been dogmatic, <laughs> definitely, right? But I'm not dogmatic enough to say like, you know, you've got to throw everything away. What I am is a committed relativist, right? You know, all things being equal, I'm committed to this theoretical approach. And what I'm going to do is explore the boundaries of it and the limitations, right? Because I believe that, Many of the so-called old school, let's call them old school, traditional or well-founded approaches that are adopted and have become commonplace and dominant paradigms within within coaching actually can be uh, utilized in a very different way um, using, using an ecological lens. So it's not like, right, if you do this, if you do this activity, Therefore, you're just in that space. You do this activity. I actually believe they exist within an, e an ecological worldview. Anyway, so I don't think you, you necessarily need to not be pragmatic. You can still be theoretically informed by that approach without necessarily having to go down this kind of, you know, throw the baby out the bath, throw the theor no, throw the pra practical baby out with the theoretical bathwater. All right, I don't know. Anyway, anyway, sorry. Uh, make make what you will of that word salad. <laughs> yeah. No, thanks for that. Um, yeah, there's there's quite a lot there. Um, I suppose, like, I would start off by saying, like, I, I mean, if we bring it back to, I don't know, drills. We did like so. The last post, the, the post that you responded to was technique v skill, mm. and there was a good paper talking about technique and uh, or defining what technique is and defining what skill is. Mm -hmm. So I suppose with that, like, I think we both agree that generally in coaching, in man in, like in many scenarios, there is a complete, there is a complete bias or there's an over-reliance on the use of isolated drills. Yes. So like that's pretty that's pretty pretty important to, to like so that's kind of the common ground what i would say is while that is um that is like often that's referred to as because it's you know a traditional approach or like these um like people are relying on the traditional kind of information processing theory um, there's two things I would say about that. Um, in terms of coaches, there's an assumption that coaches are working from a th theoretical standpoint. Yeah. Yep. And often, especially in my, especially in my experience, like, uh, you know, at, at the rugby club I was working at, every every year we get twenty new under six coaches, mm. and they're just parents. Like so, they they don't have they haven't they haven't given a, a single thought to what their coaching philosophy is or how how they're going to coach. So like, oftentimes, they're they're not they're not working from a theoret theoretical model. They're probably just copying what other people are doing, which which was derived from a theoretical model. 
Mm, maybe. <laughs> I, or I, even, I'm even not, not that it, it's folk pedagogy then. <laughs> Correct. Like I, I think more is more is reliant on tradition, copying mm. and pasting, mm. rather than theoretical model. The second point I would say about that is the traditional information processing theoretical model. It doesn't say it doesn't say to spend an ordinary amount of time doing drills. Mm -hmm. That is that is an incorrect correct assumption of the theoretical model. Mm -hmm. So then that then the question becomes: Is the theoretical model wrong, or are people who interpret that wrong? Yeah, good so point. Then, <clears throat> and then, so this is kind of the other. This kind of leads on to the to the other <clears throat> point around or to, to my next point around ecological dynamics. So ecological dynamics, I would say for for a lot of it, information processing, ecological dynamics, they say a lot of the same things in, in, different, in different words. Information processing probably gives a little bit more emphasis on the individual, hence the name, information, pro, the individual is processing information. Ecological dynamics probably emphasizes the relationship between the performer and the environment, hence the name ecological. So they're saying a lot of a lot of different things. But if we if we start at the point where, you know, coaches are uncritically applying one theoretical model, mm -hmm. and then we just give them another theoretical model. And uncritically just... applying that. Yeah, that's not the solution. You know, yeah, you yeah, know yeah. what I mean. So, like, Good, yeah. the un the uncritical application of one model yeah. should not be corrected by the un uncritical application of another. Totally. So, what I would say is, <clears throat> for me, like, and like, uh, I, I'm, I'm probably a bit, um, almost a bit more, maybe a bit more of a relativist than you, but like, I would, I would say, it's healthy. It's, it's, it's really healthy to have these different perspectives because when when it comes to evaluating the problem you have more than um more than one more than one kind of way to reflect or one theoretical model to reflect against for me the solution is to help coaches how can we help coaches actually think critically and reflect critically about what what they've done now that can be very difficult if the coaches themselves they don't have anything to reflect against so they're only reflecting against their own experiences yep. so nice. like you know if if they're only reflecting on what they've done and what they've seen there's no quality assurance there yep. so like how do they know how do they know what's good how do they know what's bad so like it, i suppose my point would be like there's nothing wrong with educating coaches on ecological dynamics information for all these kind of theoretical constructs and i think it can help but that's not the solution or it's definitely not the solution on its own mm. like we have to we um for me as a coach uh, but having been in kind of coach development for the last while we have to support coaches and actually reflecting on their experiences mm. and then kind of you know what i mean so just teaching them how to think critically rather than just moving from one uncritical application to another. And and I guess part of that, um, I hundred percent agree, by the way, I love that. And I wrote that down, you know, this, the idea of the, the uncritical application of one model is, is not the answer, but providing another model to be uncritically applied is not the answer either. Um, <clears throat> the point is the uncritical application, right? So um, I, I guess part of the, part of the way of, uh, of of developing that sort of more like the, the critical application is to raise awareness of alternatives you know because if if somebody essentially adopts essentially a folk pedagogy loads of research anastada's just done some stuff loads of research about that um if they adopt that then they um uh you know they don't know any difference until somebody helps them to know something different from which they've actually got a comparison. I, you, when, while you were talking, I was thinking about it. It's, it's like it's like somebody, like my son's just about to do his, his GCSE exams. He's like his high school exams, right? It's like doing that and then saying, right, uh, do, do your thing and then then mark mark your own paper. But you haven't got the right answers. 
<laughs> so you don't know whether you're you're just going to give yourself the same score, aren't you? So you've got no reflection point. Um, now, I th and I also think something else I heard you say, which I think is really useful, is this idea that um, you know that information processing, you know, isn't saying do a load of drills. It's saying do this. It's it's not, you know, and. And I, I also agree with you about the point that, you know, coaches aren't necessarily theoretically informed, albeit I, where I where I will maybe disagree on that is I think they are. They just don't know that they are. Uh, Rob Gray's been heard to say this a lot, which is to say, um, you know, kind of like what, what's what what theory of human learning or learning theory are you utilizing? And most people will. I, I asked this myself, you know, room of 300 people. How many of you are using a learning theory as part of your approach to coaching? Two hands went up. Room of 300. Um, and I'm saying, you know, I say, well, actually, you might not think you've got a learning theory, but you have. Um, because there are there is a dominant paradigm that exists in the world of education that most people adopt from, and there's a reason why most coach education is is driven by an approach, and why some of this folk, med uh, folk pedagogy has come from. It must have come from somewhere, and it must have come from somebody quite informed, using an approach and saying this is the approach to use. And when you look at old coaching manuals, you see lots of. Uh, they're not explicitly maybe referencing like Fitz and Posner, but they're definitely uh they're definitely sort of expounding methods that are driven by those ideas of essentially a linear pedagogical approach as opposed to the non-linear pedagogical approach so um i do but i do think whilst coaches probably don't know that they're working under a theoretical paradigm um and they're just doing what they've always what they've seen what they've done whatever the predominance of a the you know, an educational paradigm rooted in the ideas of mechanization, reductionism, and linearity is very, very influential on how people ad ad adapt into a sports realm. So, I guess part of my sort of raging against the machine is um, if you understand that there is such a sort of uh, hegemony around, you know, kind of theoretical approaches. Unless people are exposed to the alternative, they'll just continue to uncritically do this. And this is this goes this goes back, by the way, to governing body coach education policy, much of which over the course of my 25, 30 year career has been I've done the same thing. I've used linear talent development models. I've used linear skill acquisition frameworks. I've talked about human beings as stepping into certain average buckets and all those sorts of things. And I look back now and I cringe. And that's because I was influenced by some of those ideas until I had a bit more awareness and I was exposed to different ideas about human learning and through bitter experience in lots of ways and a lot of errors, I've come to it. So I guess, I mean, you make a really good point, but I, I get slightly worried about this because what I feel like what we're doing is we're potentially giving the coach education world, those who develop the systems of coach education and for that matter, coach developers and coaches a get out of jail free card so i'm i'm being a little forceful because i'm saying well look unless you properly explore this stuff right and some in order to properly explore it you can't do a bit of both right because otherwise how can you actually genuinely know whether what you're doing is effective or not um so give it all i'm saying is give it a good go um i've given it a good go and found it actually pretty joyful experience therefore pretty committed to it but at the same yeah. time, still also wary of the limitations, which is why I'm interested in your article. Yeah. So, um, yeah, another in-depth question there, which is great. Um, um, I suppose the first thing, like in terms of um coaches, they, they are working to a model, even if they can't articulate it. Yeah. Um, I think that's a hard push because like so for example i was at a i was at a kind of a coaching forum here um not last weekend but the weekend before 300 coaches and watching sort of the session by expert coaches which were a lot a lot a lot of it was thrilled anyway but <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll we'll skip over that but like out, out of the 300 coaches there was probably at least 100 filming what was happening Mm. So like I I I think I, I like I wouldn't be surprised if coaches actually didn't didn't think about the learning model that was going on in their head and they just did they're just copying literally doing what what they've seen other people do. Mm. Um, 
in terms of the coach development, so this this is a, this is another really good one because I kind of had this conversation a couple of times with with the head of sport in our school. So there's kind of a trade off. Well, what I what we described as a trade off between athlete development and coach development, mm -hmm. and so like at the start of a year when new coaches come in, like we'd love for them to be free and to explore this ecological approach and manipulate constraints and whatever else. And then that would lead to potentially a better experience for the athletes because they're exploring like nonlinear, all, all this stuff. Mm. And like, that's great in an ideal world, but the reality is the head of sport who is funded by the school who might be on a government grant. So like there's all that going on. He has a limited budget, so he can't invest in a lot of time in actual coach development to support these coaches to best deliver a an ecological constraint led approach, whatever you want to call it, yeah, to give their athletes the best experience. So the solution, the solution in that case might be a book of drills, which may take away from the athlete experience, but it it ensures it's at a a certain level. So yeah. that he doesn't get parents coming to him. So like it's very it's, it's it's much more complex than just focusing on what the athlete's experience is or you know, in terms of a coaching session. Like there, there is a, like way like and when when you kind of analyze it like that, it kind of makes your coach development like it can it, it can really inform your coach development strategy because if you start then trying to provide support to the coaches but then in year two and year three they just go back to handing coaches to book of drills like we're, we're, we're applying a kind of almost um a pedagogical solution on, on the coal face but it's not actually addressing the problem which is further up the chain mm. so like i suppose it's like and this goes back to the context of and yeah, it, it depend like your your coach development strategy that you implement. It really does depend on the context, um. So yeah, that that's kind of where I'd go with coach education at this point. But so and, and like that kind of brings up brings up another kind of dichotomy of, do you do you educate coaches or do you develop coaches on their ability on or do you educate coaches on the what to coach or the how to coach? Mm. Well, and I go back to, the, you know, the under six parents, you know, their first time ever in coaching or you know, like, I mean, most of the coaches at school are young old boys. So they're, they're, they're like just one year out of, out of school and they're almost up just earning some pocket money. They need support on what to do because they, they literally haven't a clue. So some resources have to go to the what to do. And once they know what to do, then then you can sort sort of support them on how to do it better. But like, it's not again, it's not kind of an either or. It's, it's, I know you love this, but it, it kind of depends. <laughs> um, you know, so yeah. yeah I mean, uh, don't get me wrong. I mean, I think some people probably think that I'm against the it depends thing. I'm not necessarily. Um, I just think it's a cop out. I think it's too easy to say. It sounds it's it's the sort of thing that sounds sounds clever and and smart, isn't it? And you know, and coaches will you know, oh yeah, you know, and 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 theorists can scratch their chins. You know, well, of course it depends. You know, and like what? what? Yeah, that's no good to anyone, is it? Right? What's it depend on? That's the point. Well, yeah. With with that, I'd say like if depends if it depends is the end of a conversation. Yeah, then absolutely. It's a cop -out. But if it's the start of a conversation then that kind of opens the doors to explore what, well, what does it depend on? So like, um, I, I can understand what you're saying, but it, yeah, I kind of don't agree with that. Yeah. No, but I, I, it's, it's interesting though, because I, I know I, I, I'm with you. Um, however, I, I have definitely seen um, members of the academic community use it as the end of a conversation to a certain extent. It's almost that kind of sneering condescension. Well, 
course, you know, if you if you knew if you had a body of knowledge, you would have the answers to those questions. It very much, did. you know, and I, I'm I'm being a bit mean, but I have seen some of that, which is I think is particularly unhelpful. And likewise, I you know when you know coaches who are practical people and pragmatic people and are actually looking for solutions, and many of them, as you say, because of the limitations of their kind of initial basic training, so to speak. Uh, many of them are just look. They're just looking to survive, right? They're, they're drowning and they're desperate, and they'll cling on to anything that you can, any life raft you can throw at them. They'll cling on to, but to say to them, well, you know, it depends, is is not really giving them a great deal at all. It's nothing to hang on to. So, I guess you know, I, I'm, I, I think I often think about that. You know, by the way, I think about the, you know, the the practitioner and the challenges that they face, and I, and I've been doing this for thirty years, and I'm still facing into challenges and things. I've got things that I don't understand, and I don't know how to deal with, you know. And I am looking around for tell, tell give me something, give me something, give me some something that's going to help me with this particular problem that I'm presented with. And I think your point's a good one, actually, which is one of the things that we don't necessarily do a lot of is is help people to think critically, i.e., help people to think through the problems, think through how they solve problems or even even think through the ways in which they might find some answers i one of the things i like about uh one of the things i like about uh the ecological approach just going back to something you said earlier on which is the idea of you know giving somebody a book of drills is uh i think traditionally the what to coach before how to coach has been the the model and certainly through my my experience as a coach educator, very often the curriculum is designed about what to coach. It's designed activity first. So it's almost like teach, teach the fundamental movements that an individual is going to be required in order to participate in this game. That's usually the starting point. And then some governing body curriculum designers have shifted in a different direction and, and actually said, no, let's design environments and make the environments a certain way that are was going to maximize enjoyment and retention and allow uh, performance and skills to emerge from them and then often they get criticized for doing not enough of the what to coach stuff and therefore they end come back but the amount of discussions i've had with people saying if you don't teach people the techniques how can they play the game i said have you ever tried <laughs> it's amazing yeah. what they um... can do yeah, like I suppose, like going back to that point, like um, in terms of the what to coach, like do I think the what to coach should involve, you know, you know, show showing them the correct golf swing or showing them how to hold a tennis racket or what? What it depends on what sport you're in, but like, like not necessarily. I suppose, I suppose when when especially when you're dealing with new coaches, um they need they need kind of a foundation so that you know if they go in go into a session that they have a fair fair idea so like what happened in our club was for the first so our, our kind of season was set into like three terms it was it was um mapped with the with the school year so for for our coaches especially under six seven and eight eight and nine the club actually provided them with session plans. Now, the session plan didn't necessarily like it wasn't a restriction or it wasn't a regulation. This is what you have to do, but it was it was almost like as a crutch for for the coaches to go back to. But I suppose like and um in terms of the ecological approach, like I suppose one of the things where I try and try and um have a broader view is. If you are, like, and I take your point that, and I've mentioned this as well, like, just because you, you you know, you subscribe to an ecological dynamics kind of underpinnings, that doesn't prevent you from using a drill if necessary or instruction if necessary. But if you, if you base your, like, your, your, your session design or whatever it is on, an ecological dynamics approach you are definitely going to bias some some forms of pedagogy specifically the non-linear pedagogy principles and that's fine but i would say going back to the if 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 we kind of if we set out our stall around okay our kind of 
we're, we're going to use these non-linear pedagogy principles because we've subscribed to the ecological dynamics approach and whatever the situation is, we'll adapt it. For me, that's putting the cart before the horse. So like, because there may be times where the non-linear pedagogy principles aren't aren't suitable. Now, you could argue that, oh, well, if they're not suitable, that you, I'll just do a drill or like whatever, whatever, whatever it takes. But to me, that's thinking critically. Mm -hmm. So like we come back to the idea that in, w whatever theoretical um, underpinnings you have, you have to be able to think critically. And like, I think that takes that takes a long time time to go well, a long time I, i'm not sure how long it takes to develop but like we, and we, we've got to support courses on that kind of aspect um so yeah I, I don't know why. yeah i mean I, I, there's a, the more we talk about it the more the more i begin to sort of you know kind of like i was thinking about my own practice then as you were talking thinking yeah like you know how much of that like reflects me like even just at the point of you know, I'm definitely so. If we agree, right, that say the idea of information processing doesn't necessarily say do loads of technical drilling, but you, what we probably would agree though is the thinking behind information processing, i.e., uh, you know, I'm going to massively simplify this, but broadly, you know, the idea is is that what we do is we 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 do repetitive movement because we're trying to build uh, motor programs, um, you know, which essentially are brain derived, right? So we get, you know, this concept of muscle memory, maybe. So what we're trying to do is we're going to do lots and lots of repetitive movements so that those movements become automatic. And then they act as a foundational base upon which other movements can then be, can be, can be worked on and developed and developed and developed. And that's how we do things. And this is this sort of linear tradition. If we take that way of thinking as an as the approach and the, the approach to design, the approach to session design and planning and all those sorts of things, what we know is that you know people say, "Oh, you need a lot of time. You need a bit of time on task and all that sort of stuff." There's a reason why quite a lot of sessions follow a, a very very familiar pattern, which is drill some kind of in theory skill based thing and game at the end. That's the model. And the game at the end bit is definitely the, you know, what a in an hour session, you might get, what, a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes, something like that, yeah. right? So I would go, right, well, I, I just flip that on its head. You know, okay, let's start with the game or game form. And from how those individuals adapt to those games or game forms, we will derive different adaptations that will enable those individuals which might for that matter be some kind of isolated repetitive movement if it's warranted now so so the method itself the actual approach coaching approach technique isn't off the table where it's yeah. where it comes where it comes in the continuum of activity and for what purpose i.e helping an individual solve a movement problem that they've discovered that the context has derived. So it's meaningful from the get-go. Now, generally speaking, I don't, eat, I don't go there either because I feel like an, an activity form with no other form of information in it, i.e. opponent in a dynamic invasion game like, like uh, field hockey, uh, is too impoverished to really be worth the time. But that's not to say it wouldn't be used. And I was just reflecting as you were talking about it, about this critical thinking, right? Like, have I ever used isolated movement patterns? I have, 100%. And I'll tell you why. There's usually two reasons why. I don't know what else to do because I haven't had time to be able to plan and think it up and I need something on the fly. So I go to something a bit tried and tested. That's number one. I'll be honest about that. Number two, oh, three, three reasons. Number three, sorry, number two, uh, athlete says, just show me this. Just give me the movement pattern I need. And I'll go, all right, then. You know, if you're really, really, you know, demanding it, I'll do that. And the third reason is um, I know this particular group will think it's good. <laughs> and so it's a placebo. 
<laughs> it's a pacifier to let them think that they've had something that they need that they think they need and and as you know and it's like i just can't i can't even be bothered to have the discussion about it all right if you want to do five or ten minutes of stuff that i don't think is going to have any value but you think it will who am i to step get in your way for the sake of 10 minutes but we're not doing it any for long for any longer than that so I'm just thinking about like, you know, practically, I, I'm with, I think I'm with you with the message, you met, with the me, one of the messages, which is to say, look, let's be on the side of the practitioner who may or may not have this degree of knowledge. And therefore, let's 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 cut them some slack, I suppose. Is that, is that sort of what you're saying? Yeah, like, um, again, there, there's a lot there, I suppose, like in terms of what you described, the skill drill game. And how you'd flip it, like I, I agree. Like we agree on on that. That's the typical way a session would go across probably every sport skill or drill skill game. Um, any team sport especially. Mm-hmm. But again, I kind of like I kind of go back to saying, like, that's if it is down to it, uh, to say the information processing approach like it's a, it's a misinterpretation to say like that's that's what like because e- e- even in the information process and like it's still it still recognizes the value and the importance of you know uh, the perform environment relationship and all that um i think but sorry let me just quickly if i can ask on that if it does if it does put an emphasis on the performer environment relationship why why has there become the pre- preponderance of isolated movement um, practices? Like it, it feels as if it's either a huge misunderstanding of the theory, which has then been put into practice con- entirely incorrectly, or there is something in the theory driving people into that direction. Um, I so I don't think it emphasizes it as much as the I think it recognizes. Um, but again, I think. Like I think it comes down to tradition, um, in terms of seeing seeing what other people do. Like so that mm. that that'd be my that'd be kind of what I would argue that most coaches apply on tradition, tradition of what they've seen. They don't actually assess assess what what they need to do or what you know what what's needed at any given time. Um yeah. But yeah, to to an extent, I, I, like I, I, like for me, I I suppose I would think, and this is kind of the technique skill going back to that or what what we're talking about, like having that mental representation is is still useful, like I I think it's still useful and that provides, that provides um an opportunity from which players can adapt from, which is inevitably. It's, it's inevitably really important that they do adapt from it. Like, so thinking that, I suppose, thinking that a mental representation is the perfect way to do something. Like, I, I don't think, but again, if we look at it from a coach's point of view, setting up a drill where, you know, they're getting all these, all their players to do a particular skill or a particular action, technique, whatever it is, like that, that might be a really, um a really suitable option for the coach to manage the group mm. because if they might find it really difficult in a game based environment so like again like and in that situation i i don't think that coach is necessarily saying okay there's one te- one te- perfect way to do this i want you all to do it like this it might just be um a suitable teaching strategy that he's using to provide the base from which that all players can adapt to. Mm. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Like I suppose, um, both. Like I, I would, um, not, in in no way am I saying that, uh, you know, the importance of adap- being a- being adaptable and self organization is not important. It is, but I suppose I I just don't think it's it's one or the other. Again, I, I go back like like the what coach how to coach both are important it's about which one when you know rather than one or the other yeah yeah I, it, yes and i suppose the argument is is like is it is there a hierarchy does one need to come before the other or 
can they develop? I mean, the, the, the thing is, they do develop naturally as we go. Um, uh, just as we're, so, I, I wanted to. We've talked about the article, so I just we thought better go into it because obviously, you know, this is like the longest setup ever. Um, and so I just wanted to read a little bit in it actually because I thought it was really interesting. And um, we you talk about um, you talk about Wallgate. Uh, so he said there was an uproar over a video of underage football training session where they're passing the ball against a wall to themselves, a low variability task. But from a 20 second clip, many felt it was, appropriate, it was appropriate to judge the suitability of the training task. Because the training clip, ball against the wall task lasted about three seconds, did not align with their preferred method, method of practice. They felt it was appropriate to criticize and use it as an opportunity to guide and encourage others to their own way of thinking. Um, in my view, while methods are obviously important and the source of many disagreements among practitioners, understanding the context will assist in determining the relative suitability of each method. Rather than blindly adhering to methods without considering the contextual factors, ideally principles should be meta-theoretical, allowing for broad application. So it's an interesting passage that, so I wonder if you wouldn't mind unpacking it for those who might not be as well versed in kind of the, the, the sort of the underp underpinning ideas that you're trying to push across. Yeah. Um... I've never had my writing read back before. <laughs> yeah, and just kind of, I suppose, like, you're probably aware of the video. Like, I think it was, there might have been 12 or 15 or 20 players and they each had a ball and they were each kicking, kicking the ball against the wall. And, you know, there was um some argument saying, like, all these players, why why couldn't you get them into a game? 1v1s, 2v2s, all, all this stuff. Um, I suppose... Um, why that kind of, um, like I, I suppose I was I was thinking very much of the coach at that point, like writing what I was writing, like how do you know, you know, say say he was a professional coach and he had just come from another session and he needed an extra five minutes to set up and now you could argue that, you know, he could have set up games as well, but like it's it's an easy like. Grab a ball, kick the ball against the wall, work on, work on left foot, right foot, whatever it is. So how do you know that wasn't just a convenient strategy for the coach? Um, how do you know that, for example, he might have told the players to work on purely their weaker foot? Now, um, what I would say about that is, um, like I I would almost describe. So I mean, this touching on. Um, touching on what we what we spoke about the start the capacity the skill continuum like I would almost describe being able to kick off your weaker foot as a capacity and if you don't have that capacity it's not going to emerge in the game like skills emerge but capacities don't so if you don't have the capacity to do that now so like potentially that was while it is technique I, I don't think uh, an isolated technical drill was I, I like I, I don't think an isolated technical drill is such a bad thing as long as it's applied appropriately within the group um so yeah I suppose I was looking like I, I like I was very much thinking of the coach like and thinking of like well how how do we know what his decision making process was like? How do we like? How can we critically analyze or critically assess his decision making process if we don't have all the information that he had or that that he used to make the decision to do do that particular task? Um. So yeah, that was that was kind of my thought process. It's interesting because this this it's this happens all the time or it used to um not so much anymore seems like uh people have sort of chilled out a bit but it used to happen all the time which is <clears throat> coach posts a uh, video of activity uh people criticize it other people defend it <laughs> and usually the defense is you don't understand the context and that's generally how the discussion goes it and depends. i, I yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I, I've had I, I've had that as well, you know, where I've called certain activity forms, certain things, forms of cruelty or whatever. And I've had, uh, you know, people piling on me as well, saying, you know, how dare you? What the hell? You know, how do you know what the coach was thinking? And, you know, what about this poor coach? You know, you feel like, you know, what about them? And how do you feel about them? And, you know, you being so critical. 
Um, so this is sort of how I look at it. And this is one of the reasons these things sort of continue to happen. So just to give a bit of context to the particular clip, uh, and this is where I usually get a bit responsive. So um, the, the particular account or the coach's account uh, were, made reference to their place of work, which was a European, a very well-known, uh, you know, kind of lauded European football club academy. Therefore, it's got it's got immediate clout. And of course, because it's got clout, it's going to influence. And social media is a form of influence. And so this particular practice being presented by an individual with that kind of clout and therefore that kind of knowledge is going to influence others. And so when you see that, and you see that kind of activity being presented as an acceptable activity form in that environment, individuals are going to criticize it. They're going to say, you're a professional. We assume you're a professional. You might be a volunteer, but you're still a professional because you're working in a in that kind of an environment that not everyone can work. So you must be quite good. You must be doing some things well, generally. Not always. You could just be somebody's mate, but it does work out. You know, you must be quite good. Or at the very least, you've got a badge attached to you that suggests that you know what you're doing, right? And you're going to influence others. So others are going to push against it and say, this activity form is is an inappropriate representation of the kinds of activities that should take place at all. So one, the argument being made is, if you've got a group of humans together and they've come together and traveled together to be together, to interact together, why don't you get them to interact rather than get them to use an inanimate object? You know, And, and to be honest, th there isn't really a context where that works. Like that's not, it doesn't have value. Now, that's not to say kicking a ball against a wall has no value because for years and years and years, people have kicked a ball against a wall and got loads of goes. So kicking a ball against a wall, if you're on your own, is a great thing to do. It's better than doing nothing, 100%, right? But if you've brought people together, interact. So that's the kind yeah. of central argument that's being made here. Yeah. But people go like, but the, the, but this, so this notion of context is a bit like, well, to be honest, it doesn't really matter. Well, firstly, it does matter. What this video represents is either an individual essentially doing a form of one of the three things I've done, a form of placebo, right? Or they've uncritically applied some form of theoretical underpinning or copied something someone else has done and are doing this based on, in my opinion, and I think by your argument, a misapplication of some of the theoretical ideals um, and therefore presenting it as good. It needs challenge. And I believe yeah. that the coaching industry needs to be a little bit less um, fragile to criticism and pearl clutching and needs to actually say, if somebody puts something out there, let's talk about it. Let's criticize it, but let's also defend it and let's have a debate because the debate is valuable. Because it helps others to then begin to develop their critical faculties. But to say, actually, you have no right to criticize that coach. You don't understand their context. Well, that's that's really bad, in my view, and actually doesn't help the coaching profession. It's not a profession. It's a craft. Because if, you, if coaching wants to be taken seriously and wants to become a profession, you have to put your work up for critical evaluation by your peers. Yeah. Yeah. Um... A couple of things. So, like in terms of um, you know, in terms of why you do it, like uh, uh, another kind of continuum that I talk about or that I have written about is the repetition to representativeness continuum mm -hmm. scale. Mm -hmm. So, and again, similar to the similar, to, like I mean, there's loads of different capacities or loads of different continuums continuums that coaches have to navigate in any given session performance learning whatever whatever it is so on this particular one rep repetition to representativeness it's not like and again I, I try and avoid a situation where a coach defines himself as a representative coach or a coach defines himself as a rep repetition coach they need to be able to flexibly move move up and down so in a in a situation like that what if he was doing that for two minutes at the start of a session 
and then the other 58 minutes say if it, if it was an hour session the other 58 minutes were all representative representative activities now if that wasn't the case and he, he actually like and the coach was like I suppose I I put it put it like this like so if 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 you were working one to one with a coach and you were supporting them, and that that was the activity that they did and they did it for a prolonged period, like obviously that would be problematic, but would you how would you go about approaching that with with that person one to one like would you try and ridicule him or shame him into doing something else or would you try and educate around the critical thinking? Um, and I think that's the other point, like, um, around the critical thinking. Like maybe he maybe he didn't apply it critically enough, or maybe maybe he did, and that's the solution he came with. We we don't know that, but like, to, like for other people or for other coaches, they need to be critical about everything they see as well. So like, it's not just and like I I get your point that the. That 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 account or whoever whoever it was would have been a leader in the in industry or whatever 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 you want to call it. Like they would have been a leader. So what they what they post has a lot of weight, but at the same time, that doesn't relieve everyone else of their critical thinking duties to critically apply for their players. You know what I mean? So, um. I yeah like but again I I get your point around like evaluation like put like it, it, if you put your put your work out there like it, like not everyone is gonna like it and that's kind of one of the reasons why and luckily it's kind of led to this conversation around you know putting my work out there and someone doesn't like even even the last one like I've had a, a couple of people talk, uh message me or whatever or or they subtweeted or replied or whatever and oh you've missed I think you've misinterpreted Kelso's work so okay that's a that's an avenue for me to go down um I think Dan Abraham's talked about Carol Friston's work and I tried to read it and it, like it was like Latin so like I'll have to read it again at least four times to try and make any sense of it so like that that's all that's all part and part and parcel of the whole concept of sharing your work but yeah, I mean, I like I I I acknowledge your points definitely. Like I I, I do think uh, uh, like everything needs to be uh, like we need to be comfortable in the kind of in the challenge space. Like especially if we're putting work out there and you know putting work out there looking for likes. Well, if if you're putting work out there, you got to take the good and the bad kind of feedback that comes with that. Well, kind of touching on touching on that in terms of working on the coach, like that working with the coach one to one or as a coach support, you've got to be kind of aware that aware of what what is the kind of the the emotional disturbance. Like so, if I if I deliver this feedback, you know how do, how do, how is he gonna respond or how is he he gonna react to that like because if he if he if he's like oh I don't like that feedback and then he quits well then our club is down a coach and we need to we need to recruit recruit a new one how can we kind of give him the feedback that he wants to kind of grow from um now that's not saying that you should always be supportive sometimes you need to be a bit more critical and that that might be what that coach particular need particularly needs at any given time. Um and then the same with athletes, like it's not about, you know, wrapping them up in cotton wool or bubble wrap. Sometimes they need to be challenged and they need to be told because that part that's the developmental experience that they'll need as they get older. Um so yeah, that's there's quite a lot in that as well. Yeah. So No, no, it, it's really it's a it's a good point. I mean, and actually I think one of the things that I I guess I've just reflected on and I've reflected we reflected on since that particular incident and beyond is you know actually you know what is the value of ridicule or you know being unkind in in this space um and um 
I guess it's one of the problems with the form, the media, isn't it? In the sense that, you know, it, it very often descends into that. It's not, it's not a brilliant medium for debate. I think most people realise that now. And it can become really quite toxic because people, I think, are led into, you know, kind of more and more hyperbolic language as a mechanism by which to make their point because actually nuance doesn't come across particularly well. Um, that said, um, I... Very sometimes, though, I I think then it, people probably ought to give more context and more of a ra when they post these things, they should give more context than rationale um, in their explanations of like why they're posting this and what their thinking is, rather than just put something out there and go, look, this is this is a good thing. I seem to remember with that particular post, by the way, as well, that actually the individual did make that and then subsequently when they receive some pushback double down with further examples of other similar academies doing similar things and therefore was was very much trying to defend it i don't know whether they were being deliberately provocative or not might have even been a parody account for all i or all i know um uh but anyway the, i guess so the the thing from my perspective that, like that, yeah. that's that's an example of kind of the copy and paste that we go like that we see like as in what many coaches Many like that rather than um adhering to a, a theoretical approach, they're just copying what they see. Mm -hmm. Like it see happening happening in different academies that like it can happen. Mm -hmm. So kind of that kind of feeds into what we were talking about. Was, does everyone have a theoretical model or a model of learning that they're applying to, or are they just copying copying from each other? Um. So, which and all, and all the research points to the fact that that coaches are far more influenced by other coaches, and the things that they see other coaches do, whether it's in an online space or a face to face space, than they are by really by any form of formal education, and that's backed up by my own sort of anecdote of you know being in rooms full of coaches and always asking the same question of why do you coach the way you coach or why do you do what you do the way that you do it it's very re very rarely does someone say well i read some stuff about learning theory and i understood something about information processing and thought i would apply it they don't they generally say i was coached like this and i, and I thought it was great so i thought i'd do more of it or i was coached like this and i hated it and i don't want to do it like that to anybody else that's generally the the theme so but but i, I don't by the way right i'm less bothered about the coach right in in this situation everybody tends to worry about the coach and i do think it speaks to what i think is a very coach led culture in coaching we're always trying to defend each other fair enough fair enough but we're like no one seems to think about like the so i'm i worry when i see stuff like that i worry about the relatively new coach who's going to be influenced by that and think i haven't got enough balls and go out and buy a load more and I'm also worried about the kids who that coach will then go and coach and spend however long it is kicking a ball against a wall. Like, there's just that part of me that thinks, like, and, and so I feel a sort of duty not to stand by and go, well, all right then, you know, off you go. I sort of feel a duty to say, you do realise, don't you, that that's pretty nonsensical by any theoretical underpinning that you might have. It really doesn't make a lot of sense at all. And some people really get triggered by me doing that. And I often say to them, but I know you're thinking about that human who's got a job and a, a, a degree of clout and a degree of influence. And they might be feeling a little bit chided by the fact that I've criticized their method, not them, just the fact that they did the method. But you're not bothered about like the downstream consequences of the thousands, potential, potential individuals going out, spending money they don't need to spend, doing things that the, that the kids might not find as enjoyable or that valuable. And if no one yeah. seems to think about that. Yeah. I, I, um, <clears throat> I think absolutely that that is a concern. But, um, I mean, I'm sure, sure there are people, people within the coaching space who are in it for their own kind of, you know, their own ego or whatever else. But, in my experience, generally coaches are not like that. No. The coaches are generally like they generally want to do what's best for the kids, mm. for their players, or like at any level, not just kids, but adults as well. Coaches generally are trying to do the best by their players. But 
that for me highlight the point around the importance of education and the importance of education on the ability to think appropriately and the like how to design games or whatever else so in in a flexible way so that they can then best support their players in the way that they want to like I honestly think coaches just do not they haven't like going back to what 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 we were saying what you were saying about your 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 son marking his own exam like if he doesn't have the answer what hope does he have mm. if coaches don't have any anything to reflect against what hope do they have so like rather yeah. than, like again I kind of go back to the education point around you know rather than um and this is kind of the balance between athlete development and coach development that we face in our in our school like rather than regulating the coaches need to do this 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 that's not actually developing coaches because they're just being they're, they're being made robots even though that may that may produce a minimum standard of athlete development that will, so the parents don't come but like there's a trade off between okay can we manage the athlete experience but then can we actually make sure that we're actually developing the coaches as well? Mm. So like rather than rather than regulating what they do, but trying to educate them in, on on their kind of on their kind of journey, whether that's thinking critically or how to design or how to regress or how to um how to evaluate or how to, you know, watch a game and, you know, use that as information, what whatever whatever it is. So like again, yeah, I just try and at all times go back to that education kind of education kind of thought process no it's a good one uh, i mean it's a bit like um just to sort of expand on that sort of uh exam paper it's a bit like i suppose what what often happens is you know somebody does their level best to try and do this exam with very little knowledge and then all they get is you know kind of f minus see me you're going to do detention for the rest of your life and this that and the other it's a very extreme expo as opposed to saying good effort but <laughs> and actually yeah. that's something that i've reflected on which is to say basically the critical approach perhaps is not as valuable what, what what's better is to maybe present the alternative or give a different idea and say look that's one thing but here's a an alternative that would be as as valuable or as good, or you could look at it in a different way, or if you perceive it this way. Um, but it's interesting, you know, that doesn't get as much response, doesn't get as much likes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and again, this is the problem with the medium, isn't it? But um, I mean, I, I genuinely, I said to you, I think, you know, that uh, the article, which I, I recommend anybody read, does have it had quite a few head scratches for me in there, you know. So one, one of the reasons I wanted to get you on was to just like unpack a bit of it and like kind of check my understanding and all of those sorts of things and um I, I i know you i know you weren't saying anything goes um uh and i know that isn't what necessarily people are saying but i wanted to guard against the fact that you know being being sort of you know theoretically uh well actually having a theoretical underpinning at all it's a really good starting point for anybody so that you can then be a little bit more critically aware and therefore you can critically apply judiciously various approaches knowing why you're doing so and where you're doing where you're and why and where and how and all those sorts of things and i guess that's the message that you're trying to get across which is to say you know it's not enough to say do this do that what it is is to say why should you do this and why should you do that in any given moment and it's that why question that i guess you're trying to sort of draw people towards with the article yeah exactly that like and look i i definitely don't claim to have all the answers by any means but like as, as much as possible like you know um I'm I'm in a pretty fortunate position where I'm kind of researching and studying and working with coaches full time. So like I have the time to invest in all all like and like I and that that's kind of part of why why I do write stuff on 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 the website is to actually put it out there and then see what other people do they agree do they disagree where where are the kind of holes or whatever else and like over the last six months in particular like and you're one of them like in terms of just 
people that have come back to me with alternatives or different ideas and like I like it's it's really accelerated my own growth but like I mean I, I think I might I might have said this in the in the article like it's it's about having different pairs of glasses to actually mm. do the same thing one might be rose tinted one might be some other color one might be clear so you, you know so it's just about having these different perspectives so that you can then and I, I absolutely I agree if you're starting off with no theoretical underpinnings, mm. that's fine. One is better than none. But having multiple pairs of glasses is better than having just the one as well. Like that that that's kind of how I feel around the theoretical underpinnings and just don't could... just don't try and wear them all at the same time because it's likely to blur your focus. Correct, exactly. So like I mean, um, like there's quite a lot lot um I mean, I know you're you're aware of like can you can like they're not compatible and some some of the Twitter threads they're they're really really insightful, but um from a coach, a coach isn't really thinking on that level like and I I would um there there there's a really good article by Ranganathan and Driska from last year, and they talk about like. In the same way, you know, the S and C has a different role to the skill acquisition specialist. The researcher has a slightly different role to the coach. And yes, they do work together and they can inform each other. But the coach is looking for, as, as a pragmatist, is looking for practical solutions, whereas the researcher is looking for systematic and generalizable principles. So that, and for example, like the nonlinear pedagogy principles, and they're really like if if you if you like I think I've written about fifty or sixty articles, probably thirty to forty of them are, are, are about ecological dynamics and representative learning design and all these different things. Like, you don't need to convince me on the value of them. Like I'm there. Like it's like I I I think they are really valuable, but I also think it's it's important that you can kind of take a step back, critically think, and then apply some other. I suppose more cognitive science solutions. So, like for example, at the at that um at that forum that we we're talking, Matt Wilkie, he's a high performance course developer. He spoke about um some cognitive science strategies around long term memory, especially around half time. Like so, he he got he got um one one person up and he had five tennis balls, and to demonstrate the effect of. The working memory or the how, how it works he threw every te- all, all five tennis balls at the at the individual and he didn't catch any and that's like if if, if there's that kind of goes back to cognitive load like so if you if you give if you give players too much information they're not going to take it in anything or they'll take in the wrong thing so that's why where you simplify your message so like in terms of kind of that kind of idea like um yeah just having different perspectives for different times for different situations like i think is really really healthy but what i would say is i think it's very difficult especially for an amateur coach or a volunteer coach to do that so that's where i would think like as much as possible whether it's sporting clubs or sporting organizations or schools or whatever it is or maybe governing bodies can they try and support these coaches maybe you know, or like coach ha- have a team of coach developers who who can actually go and reflect with the coach on their sessions rather than you know just the odd workshop here and there. You know, so like, but again, that that's difficult to implement. It like who knows how much funding the governing body has and whatever else. So like, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's like I I love it. It's a fascinating area, but um. Yeah, it's quite a complex one too, and and that I, that came across in the article actually. You know, you, you and this is the value, and this is why, you know, kind of kudos to you and take my hat off because what you do, what you've done there is think aloud, really. You know, this is some of the this is some of the stuff that I'm exploring and wading through, and these are the questions that it's raising for me, and this is some of the things that I'm thinking about. And I think again, you know, the more the practice, more practitioners are prepared to do that, the more it stimulates a discussion, say like this, which hopefully then stimulates further discussion with others, enables then I think and enriches the coaching landscape, and makes things better. So, um, hey, listen, really appreciate you uh, taking the time 
to speak with me about the article. Um, if other people are curious or want to find more of your writing or your research, what's the best way for them to find you? Um, my yeah, I'm pretty active on Twitter. Um, my handle is at jcasty underscore sport. Um, and then my website, which is linked on that, is um www.skilledathleticism.com um yeah so reach out to either of them happy to have a chat awesome well uh there's a lot of other rabbit holes to go down so we may well have to do a bit of a follow-up to this but listen i appreciate you uh staying at the office later than you ordinarily would uh on the other side of the world and uh Keep, keep up the good work. I'm looking forward to the next article you post. And I'd also be really interested to see some of the research that you're putting out there. Um, yeah. So uh, keep it going. Brilliant. Thank you.